All right, thank you. It looks like we got a sparser crowd than uh, than we've had. But um, I'm Andy Murdoch. I represent Lindsay in the southeast, and what we try to offer is ways to manage the risk of weather variability during the dropping season. So that means irrigation. Um, tell you a little bit about Lindsay. What we've um, we're obviously known for zematic center pivots, but we've started to build on that foundation by purchasing other companies that add um, unique value to an irrigation um, design and installation and part of the project. And um, let me go back if I can figure out how to operate this. These are some of the companies and brands that uh, we've pulled together at Lindsay. Um, we, uh, we started by um, Watertronics pump stations, variable frequency drives. They are experts in design build of um, unique, efficient pumping systems for uh, for our ag applications. Whether that's pumping surface water from streams or ponds or deep well applications, they um, they design build efficient operating systems that operate at the lowest possible pressures that are required for the application. So that's a design that's set up to save you money from an energy perspective and uh, to give good consistent applications of uh, water across uh, the fields. We've um, also added um, IRZ and Easy Wireless. They're um, a couple of companies out uh, in the Oregon area. They provide um, expertise from a project perspective. If there's some um, in-depth environmental permitting that has to go on to achieve water withdrawal permits, they can help with that. They're um, very good at laying out uh, water reservoirs, large uh, pipe systems that are efficient, um, uh, uh, rerouting electrical power into a project. Uh, they can assist us on, on all of these pieces and parts. Um, Easy Wireless it was actually employed at D River Ranch. You probably heard about yesterday that we can set up a farm-wide Wi-Fi network in case you don't have good cell service in your area, and yet you're desiring automation from an irrigation standpoint. And our irrigation uh, automation comes in from our FieldNet brand of products and services, and that's where we remotely monitor and control pumps, pivots soil moisture stations, weather data, all from your smartphone, tablet, and certainly from, um, you know, from a, from a computer perspective. So, you know, we can um, set up water plans in advance. We can turn them on and off. We can monitor their activity. We can have histories of water application events from a pivot perspective. From a pump perspective, we can monitor pressure flow um, get real-time data on, on what that pump or pump system's doing. Um, in some cases, if you need to accumulate water records that are accurate to report to the authorities you're, you're, you're permitted from, you know, it provides a good, handy, easy way to collect those records and um, have them at your fingertips to report. We just recently purchased Lacos. They're a filtration company primarily um, well and pump filtration. So um, if you're having problems with debris, sand, these type of things that wear on pump impellers, that wear on sprinklers, uh, we've got some unique uh, solutions to um, filter that sand out before it, it causes some premature damage to your pumps or sprinklers or, or inhibits the flow or the accurate application of, of the water you're trying to put out. Um, and, um, you know, we're always looking to add value, and um, that's part of um, uh, what Lindsay's trying to do. We just purchased um, another company that's uh, involved in machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication technology out of Kansas City. We just uh, announced that about a week or two ago. So we'll be incorporating their design expertise in our family of products we use to continue to monitor and control um, a, a whole irrigation project and set up all the pieces and parts. Um, our pivots kind of have a heritage of, we always talk about they're, they're strong, they're well built, they're heavy, durable, rugged, um, easy to use. We have integrated technologies and we believe we got the broadest line of, of solutions that's all under one umbrella. And 
you know, we start with um, when we go out on a project at, from a design standpoint, you know, um, we use uh, GPS mapping and, um, and software to uh, build a real accurate uh, map, as we might say, uh, of your project. And um, we can employ all the other pieces and parts from controls and monitoring um, and, and other weather data tools that can come along with this. So um, all of this uh, pieces and parts are delivered through our, our dealers and the local dealers in Alabama for the uh, south and central part are through uh, Sun South, over in the western part of the state, Black Prairie Tractor out of Columbus, Mississippi, and up in the northern part of the state, H&R AgriPower out of Tanner, Alabama. So um, you can also get more information, go into zomatic.com and click on our dealer locator. And um, these dealers can extend all these pieces and parts, whatever is really needed to develop an irrigation solution on your farm. And uh, we hope you'll give us a call, um, give us a chance to help you out and show you what's possible. Um, we'll be happy to do that. So. Um, if there's a question or two, that's all I have. I'll, I'll answer a question. I think we might have time, but uh, all right. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good deal. My name is TJ Mallett. I'm the Ag Specialist for the Southeast for Advanced Drainage Systems. Uh, we are the world's largest polyethylene pipe manufacturer. We have 48 locations, plants across the country. Uh, we service all areas of the United States, Canada, and into Mexico. We uh, actually got our start in agriculture. The first pipes for tiling were made out of clay tile uh, back in the 30s and 40s. And from there, systems evolved and the pipe evolved to where it's made out of that black corrugated pipe now, single wall with perforations. That's how we got our start. From there, we turned into the world's, like I said, largest pipe manufacturer. We mainly deal in dual wall pipe uh, for culverts and whatnot now, but still agriculture is one of our driving factors of business. How many of you are familiar with tiling? Okay, good, good. Several of you. Uh, well, what tiling is, for those of you that don't know, is draining the excess water from the plant root zone by lowering the water table, lowering and being able to control it. The tile lines are called laterals, which connect into mains. They're usually four inch single wall perforated tile lines. And what that does is it lowers the water table. This is a water table that's fully saturated zone. That's when it fills up all the air pockets with water instead of those nitrate and phosphorus that you need. Here's the water table when it's lowered through the series of pipes and laterals. From there, the laterals drain the water into a system of mains, and that increases your yield. What that does is it better develops your roots, you get a more uniform stand, and it turns bad ground into good ground and good ground into great ground. You can expect to see about a 15 to 25 percent bump on corn and beans. This is another slide showing the difference between a poorly drained crop and a properly drained crop. One of the ben biggest benefactors of tiling your fields is not only the boost in yields you get, but timely planting and harvest. One of the biggest factors of being able to get in your field at the exact right time to plant your crop and being able to get into the field to harvest your crop. From there, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Bob Clark with Clark Farm Drainage. He's a tile contractor in northern Indiana, uh, western Indiana, and uh, they've been tiling for thir three generations, I believe, and, uh, and, and Bob will be able to walk you through how to design a system and uh, how, how some of these systems work and really drawing down your water table. Thank you. Um, thanks, TJ. So I know that a lot of people raised their hands and said they were familiar with tile, um, but I do know that tiling as a practice is not as common in the South as it is in the Midwest. In the Midwest, most fields, at least uh, if you drive through Indiana, most fields have tile in them, and a lot of those fields are systematically tiled. So every acre uh, would be drained with these little pipes kind of running at a certain spacing, you know, whether they be 40 feet apart or 60 feet apart. So there's a lot of uh, 
ADS pipe. Uh, there's a lot of corrugated plastic under the ground uh, throughout the Midwest. And I think that um, before I'm, I'm going to explain sort of what some of the major considerations are when you design a system, but I think it, there's one thing that should be highlighted. You know, people tend to focus on what they can see. So uh, we think of excess water when we see it on the surface. So we see ponding and we see surface water and we think we have a water problem. If you have a, a pest problem in your crop and you can see the leaves damaged, you know, those are things that you think about. Um, and they're things that you try to come up with solutions for. You also have water, as you all know, under the ground, you have subsurface water. And that water can hurt your crops quite a bit, more than you may, might realize, actually. Um, depending on when you have excess water, uh, you can really hurt root development, and uh, that's going to show up in your yields. So you might be able to get a crop, you might be able to get out there and plant and harvest, but your numbers uh, in terms of your total yields might not be nearly as high as they could be uh, if you could manage that water better. Um, so this picture right here is just a, an example of a systematic drainage project. Um, when you're going to design a, a pattern drainage project like this, you have to think about a handful of things. You have to consider the soil and what type of soil it is and how the characteristics of that soil change as you move downward through the soil profile. The most important characteristic is how quickly water can move through the soil profile. So how permeable is the soil? Obviously, if you have very sandy soils, water will move very quickly. If you have very high clay soils, water tends to get trapped. It, it moves very, very slowly. That will uh, affect how closely you need to place the tiles together. Uh, the other thing is that these tiling systems are gravity-fed systems, so it would be just like any, any ditch that you would dig, any surface drainage that you would do, the water needs to be able to flow downhill. Um, so coming up with a topographic map of the field and then being able to design the system so that all the tiles are this gravity-based network um, is, is important. Um, the other thing here is the drainage coefficient, so different crops um, and different uh, types of uh, practices with different crops uh, require the water to maybe be removed more or less quickly. So a row crop maybe might not need the water to be removed as quickly as a truck crop, uh, for example. So when you design a drainage system, you look at the soil, you figure out how quickly you need to have the water removed, and then you lay the, the, the drainage system out accordingly to meet those uh, characteristics. And lastly, you need to have a, an appropriate outlet. So all this water uh, is going to flow downhill in the pipes to somewhere and that could be a ditch, it could be a reservoir where you collect the water, um, it could be a stream. So that kind of varies from uh, project to project. That's a picture of a tile plow, so I know some of you might have pull type plows that they also make which you could attach to your tractor. Uh, this is one of our plows, um, that's 12 inch tile being plowed in in Indiana. Um, would you like me to show the video now? I have a little video here just so you can kind of, I'm more of a visual person myself. Um, this video is going to demonstrate <laughs> IT. <laughs> I double clicked it, but uh, it just went to the end. Well, while she does that, this video is going to demonstrate a tile plow installing laterals. So the laterals of uh, ADS pipe would come on large uh, spools, kind of like a spool of thread. And the, uh, the plow can hold that spool and, and uh, trenchlessly with the plow, place the tile in, in the bottom of the... Uh, Place the tile in the bottom of the trench that the plow cuts. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you do want to see a video, you can come by my booth, and uh, I actually have a number of videos. Um, so, <laughs> um, I think that pretty much covers all the uh, major aspects of what you would have to consider if you have a tile system. And I hope that if any of you, I've already talked to many of you, if any of you have any curiosity about uh, either getting into tiling or having a project done, hopefully, um, or just questions about how drainage systems work or how drainage equipment works, uh, come by my booth and uh, I'll answer any questions. I appreciate it, Bob. Uh, and like we were saying before, the success that they've had with some of the tiling jobs they've been doing here in the South have been astronomical. Uh, for example, in Macon, Mississippi, they did a 500-acre farm and they were experiencing about 100 on average on a normal year 145 to 150 bushel acre corn the year and the next year after they averaged about 190 to 195 bushel acre corn on that entire 500 acres in fact this past year there was the only farm in the entire area they were able to get the crop on uh, with the changes and advancements in technology from soil testing gps systems and surveying the field it can write such an accurate design and being able to test that soils can't not it will not not work sorry for the double negative but it's going to work it's just going to determine how well um, before in the southeast they didn't think it would work as well as it does up north but now more and more people are starting to do it and install tile and they're starting to see that success that uh, it's really paying for itself in no time um, but are there any questions before we wrap up all right I appreciate it thank you for your time Our next speaker will be Seth uh, Staniland from Pioneer. My name is Seth Stanley. I'm the Granos for Pioneer. I serve uh, southwest Georgia and basically Birmingham south in Alabama. Uh, I just want to talk to you real quick. Um, I'm going to get through as many as I can. I'm going to try not to go too fast. Uh, uh, just some of our new products that we have um, for north Alabama and south Alabama. Uh, I'll start out here. This is a, just a yield data from uh, north Alabama and uh, the Tennessee Valley area. Uh, one new product we're really excited about is 1197. Uh, it's been doing really good uh, all the way up in Maine, all the way almost down to the coast. Uh, and, and you can see in the trial, it, it's, it's really showing out for 111 day product. Uh, a lot of times in our area, uh, you know, we're kind of a subtropical type environment. Uh, you longer see the hybrids, your 120 day hybrids, they're, they're going to be the, uh, the real yielders. Uh, and when you have a 111 day hybrid that can hang in there, it's, uh, it's not that common. So. We, we are excited about it. Uh, the guys in North Alabama, they're a lot more familiar about this product than I am just because I'm uh, more of the coastal plain. But they're recommending a 28 to 32,000 and, uh, you know, getting r real good yields. It's not really a silage corn. It's a little bit shorter stature corn than a lot of Pioneer's products. But uh, seeing some great yield out of it uh, across the board, and it's also doing good in some drought-type environments as well. Uh, as far as our South Alabama plots, uh, I did want to talk about first, uh, before I launch into new hybrids, 1319. Uh, we've had some really good performance out of this product. Uh, I know a lot of you guys that plant Pioneer corn are probably familiar with it. It does real good irrigated. This also does, uh, does very good um, uh, under limited irrigation and stress type environments. Uh, this is our uh, irrigated corn trials. You can see it, it, it topped our trials. Um, you know, our irrigated trials only average about right at 200 bushels this year. And, you know, it was off, uh, off year uh, across the board for corn. And in a lot of cases, the dry land did almost as good as irrigated. 
Um, and uh, this is our two-year dry land. Uh, you can see it, our two-year dry land trials average 170, so there's only 30 bushels difference between our dry land and our irrigated trials, but 13, 19 taught them both. It's just a really tough hybrid, really good all-around hybrid. Uh, if you're planning on planting some corn, I'd encourage you to try a little bit of it. Uh, this is just a slide, uh, a little bit more information about 1319. Uh, it's available in, uh, with the Hercules trait or as a straight roundup. Um, you know, it's, it'll go about anywhere. I mean, it'll do, does really good. Also does good in the silage trials. And uh, Georgia and University of Florida silage trials, it, it performed very good. So if you're interested in doing some silage, it, it'll work there as well. Um, we did, we, last year we really was looking for some uh, products that work in more of a stress type environment. Uh, so we advanced 1234 and 1529. This is the first year we had these two products on the market uh, to kind of fit that niche. Um, 1529, I think, is the one we're going to go with long term. It, it, it basically topped our plots. We have 1498 on here and uh, 2089. I know a lot of you that have planted corn are probably familiar with those two products, and uh, it, it outperformed both of those in, in, the, um, in the dry land plots this year. So uh, the 1234. It's a real showy type hybrid. If you own some real tough coastal plain soils, uh, I mean, 100 to 120 bushels, this this one will probably win for you. It does a, does a pretty good pretty good job in that type of environment. Uh, 1529, it's don't do good down in low yield environments, but it's also don't do a little bit better uh, in, in higher yield. I really like this hybrid, uh, especially for some guys that, that um, are not able to manage as intensely. Uh, it's got good roots and stalks and one of the agronomically, probably one of the ag most agronomically sound corns we have. And also, uh, even in high yield, it's on yield within probably 10% of the, of the top of the plot. So uh, it's a real good hybrid. If you plant some corn, I'd encourage you to try a little bit of it this year. Uh, we do have two leptra corns in 1637 1794. Uh, 1794 is new for us this year. It's done really good uh, in the Delta all over the southeast United States and uh, University of Georgia OVTs it won by over 20 bushels. I mean, it's uh, just a, a real high yielding corn. I've, I've heard rumors that uh, the David Hula up in uh, Virginia, the, the big NCGA guy, that he's going to break a new world record with his corn. So uh, we'll see. It's uh, got tremendous yield potential. It'll work in the, in, in the prairie and in the coastal plain. Uh, tends to do better, at least in our plots, it did better down south, so it, it likes heat. Um, but very good yield potential if you've got irrigation, I, I will try a little bit of, of it. Um, this is all subject, or off subject to new products, but I did want to mention to you, um, you know, corn at, at $4 is a heck of a lot less attractive than corn at $8. So, uh, you know, I, I really encourage you to, to manage inputs this year. Um, the emphasis the last couple of years has been on how much yield you can make and uh, not necessarily what you're putting into the crop. And this is, we do population studies all over every year, and uh, this is just one of those studies. And we planted from 28 to 40,000, and you can see we got a pretty much linear yield response uh, all the way up to 40,000. We yielded 275 bushels. But the, uh, I calculated revenue just figuring the MSRP of the seed and, uh, and the, and the, the number of kernels we were dropping. And you can see we made the most money at two, um, 32,000 plants an acre with this particular product. So, so you know, we, we could have we got five more bushels planting 40,000, but it would cost us money in the long run. So I would encourage you, um, we, we have a plant rate estimator on Pioneer's website. You just put in your, the hybrid you're interested in, uh, the grain price, and you see cost 1,000, and it will shoot you out, kind of tell you where you need to be on plant population with that product because it is very hybrid specific. Uh, this, for instance, is 14.98, and uh, the lines here on the bottom are basically yield levels. So, in your low yield level, you need to be around 26,000. Your high yield level, you know, you need to be up around 38 with that product. Well, the uh, 17.39 is hybrid with more ear flex. Uh, you don't be uh, about 28,000 is all you need in a low yield environment and a high yield environment. So, this is a very hybrid specific thing. Uh, setting the planter and, and planting is not something I'd recommend. Whether it's my corn or anybody else's corn, I would encourage you to get with whoever you got it from and uh, talk about populations and talk about your inputs because that's what it's going to take to survive in the, in the current market. And uh, Pioneer, we published this. This is, uh, you know, based on agronomy trials in our area, uh, population trials that uh, the agronomists put together. And we have a sheet based on yield level of where you need to be at on populations with our products. And uh, I would encourage you to use this. 
uh, as a guide when you when you planting planting your corn uh, is really helpful and uh, will save you some money and also uh, you know keep you from having some problems too. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about seed treatments. Uh, you know, Pioneer is, is a seed company. We're, we're getting big into seed treatments, and we have three different options this year. Our standard is the PPSP 250, uh, which is what most of our seed comes with. Uh, and it's a combination of four different fungicides. Uh, Cruiser, which is, um, I'm not even going to try and thigh my thoughts in, I believe is how you pronounce that, at uh, 0.25 milligrams of active ingredient per seed. And you can see there the, uh, just a non-treated control versus the seed treatment. It, it, it helps with root development. And that's the standard treatment on all our, all our corn. Uh, we are, DuPont has a chemistry called Amevia that they will, become, will be available on uh, some of our new products in, uh, next, uh, this coming year. And it's, uh, it's chlorotranopril. I can't pronounce that, so you'll have to forgive me. But it's, uh, it, it's doing really good. Uh, it, it's showing a, about a 2.6 acre yield bo um, boost. Um, in, uh, in responsive locations, it's about 8.1 bushels. So in, in locations that saw a positive yield response, I mean, it's, uh, it's really helping. Um, and this is just a picture. Uh, you can't really tell the difference on the, on the screen, but the corn on the right is a little bit ahead of the, the corn on the left. I mean, it's a, it's a noticeable difference in a lot of cases with that Lamivia C treatment. We do have PPST 1250 with Botibo, uh, but it's, uh, you know, the primary target for it is going to be nematode control, and I, I, don't, I just don't think that Botibo does a very good job with nematodes. So, uh, um, soybeans, I'm going to try and go through this real quick. I don't, I don't know where I'm at on time. Okay, uh, but the big one I'll talk about is 47T36. Uh, this is a, if you're looking for an indeterminate, uh, this tremendous yield in soybean. Uh, in Georgia, we did a high yield soybean trial this year, and uh, this one I think did 108 bushels. Uh, so it's uh, got some tremendous yield potential. It averaged 73 in the plots in Tennessee and North Alabama for those guys up there. Uh, it's a yield leader. I mean, full season or double crop, this this thing will work. Uh, there's not really a lot of lot to say bad about it. And it's got soybean cyst nematode. If if that's a problem for you, and uh, if you're interested in planting an indeterminate uh, late four, I, I definitely would give this one a look. Uh, 48T53 is kind of complements um, 47T36. If you're moving to later plantings, uh, this will probably be one you want to choose. Uh, got very good against charcoal rot, frog eye, and uh, soybean cyst nematode. As far as determinants, uh, which primarily what we plant down south, uh, we have uh, several uh, group fives that are new this year. 52T50. Uh, this one has very high yield potential. Um, it's a brown bean. A lot of folks like a brown bean. Uh, it's very tall, but it stands very good. It's probably got the best standability of anything we got. It's doing very good in Alabama and Georgia. The only weakness with this one is this slight, slightly below um, average on iron chlorosis, if that's a problem for you. And um, it, it also is, it doesn't have any uh, nematode tolerance. Uh, 52T86 uh, has, is um, southern root knot nematode and multi race cyst. It's got a very good disease package with it. It's also a brown bean, it's very similar to 52T50 as, as far as appearance, in my opinion. Um, the 52T86 is going to be a couple bushels behind 52T50 in the yield, as far as yield. But, um, you know, I really think uh, for the defensive package that this bean offers, it is very competitive on yield. If you've got some tough, tough situations, uh, I would encourage you to try this. Let me give this one a try, uh, shot. It's also pretty good on iron chlorosis if you, if you have a problem with that. Uh, launching, the last thing I want to mention is uh, six or seven soybeans. Pioneer's been out of this market for several years. Uh, we have been testing uh, some late soybeans. We got two that we're going to introduce this year. We had it in the plots versus Agro, uh, Asgro 6931. You can see it's right up there with yield. Uh, it's tip for tat, the six, seven. Actually, as you, as you moved east, it did even better than this. Uh, but it's uh, both look very good. Both are uh, dark beans. Uh, this is the plot down in uh, South Alabama, North Florida area, uh, around Atmore. Uh, good against Phytophthora and uh, also Southern Root Knot Nematode. Uh, it's the, these are going to be the Roundup Ready 2 beans, uh, the Roundup Ready 2 uh, technology from uh, Monsanto. Uh, I really don't see any advantage of Roundup Ready 1 over Roundup Ready 2, but it is the latest Roundup uh, gene that Monsanto is offering. Um, 
and this bean looks very good. Uh, if you want a little bit later bean, we have a 7.6. It's a lot of the same uh, attributes as the 6.7. Uh, this one it does not, it seems to be a bushel or so behind the 6.7, but still very good yield. Um, so if you if you got some uh, if you're interested in uh, planting a six seven soybean, I would encourage you to take a look at ours. I, I think we have some pretty good ones. Um, and one final thing here: soybean seed treatments. Uh, Pioneer soybean seed will be available treated um, from Pioneer this year, uh, but you you have to pre-order it because this uh, if soybean seed comes treated, it has to be sold to the retailer. We're not taking it on a return just simply because it would have to be discarded. Uh, but we have a. Our Pioneer Premium Seed Treatment is the fungicide and insecticide with a biological polymer. Uh, seeing a, a, about a bushel yield response uh, in our plots with the, with the polymer, uh, about a 0.8 bushel yield response with, without the polymer. And uh, you can see the, on the screen there a little bit of root growth um, versus a non-treated control. We also have a, a PPST-120, which is 120-day uh, rhizobium bacteria. Uh, if you if you're interested in that as well, but uh, you know there's been a lot of lot going in the seed treatment business uh, as of late, and uh, you know it, it really seems to be be helping in, in the yield department if you have a problem. So uh, we, we do have the option available. And with that, uh, I, if, I want to thank you all for your business and your time, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for allowing us to be here and talk talk to you a little bit. Thank you. <coughs> I know I talk fast, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I froze it. While he's doing that, I'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, Scott Grant from Monsanto will be our uh, last speaker in the uh, industry bunch. Pioneer sign behind me. That's pretty good. Well, no, here it goes. There we go. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, thank you all for being here, and, and thank you all for supporting us in, in what we do. Um, I didn't bring a PowerPoint. I did jot a few notes down. And uh, if any of you all have ever kept up with, uh, with Monsanto, you all know when, when we pivot, we, we pivot hard. And so to talk about our pipeline, I'm going to go back a little bit and then I'll, I'll kind of come full circle. But uh, this is kind of bad because uh, it takes me, you know, 12 to 15 minutes to even introduce myself, and I'm usually walking around the stage, and I'm confined to a podium, so this can be tough. But I am Scott Grant, um, ABM from Monsanto over um, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and just a Scotia, Tennessee. So um, this year we celebrated the 40th anniversary of Roundup, and Man, what, what an amazing product. I mean, it revolutionized agriculture as we know it. And uh, it, it, it took Monsanto global. It, it spurred us and took us global. And, and all, the, all the revenue that we made off of the Roundup, we poured in to uh, biotech, as you know it. And um, basically, biotech was a, it was a platform play. We broadly licensed all of our technology to anybody who wanted it. And uh, in saying that, you know, our, our, our business grew. We, we carved out kind of a niche market in that, in that area. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk to you all a little bit about is what do we have new coming in from the biotech side? So we got a couple of things coming. In the next two or three years, you'll see Bulgard 3. And a lot of times I get questions on, well, Bogart 2 is doing a really good job. Why would you want to bring a new Bogart on? Well, you, you, if you're in biotechnology, you're always looking for durability. You don't want to see a resistant strain of any insect crop up somewhere. So you'll see us bringing on Bogart 3 in the next two or three years. Um, we brought on this last year uh, Root Knot. 
root nut nematode resistant. We released a, a really nice variety, 1454. And, and the beauty of this variety is the fact that in the presence of high nematodes, it yields very well. But in the absence of nematodes, it also yields well. And all the cotton farmers that might be in here know that nematodes aren't on a whole field, but they're in sections of a field. So you're not losing yield with, with this particular product. Um, we're bringing another root knot nematode on that's giving us a yield bump of 50 to 75 pounds this year. So our germplasm is increasing uh, our yield potential in the nematode. We'll be bringing on a reniform if anybody's got reniforms, probably in the next three to four years. We don't have anything that's going to come to the market currently, but we're working on that right now. Um, also, in the technology round, we're bringing on drought tolerant corn, or drought guard corn is what we're calling it. We're not turning corn into cactus. We're just not doing that. The majority of the work that we're doing with it is up in the Midwest. We're using groundbreaker plots to work with this stuff. We're also testing it extensively in Texas. However, for this area, we've got two varieties. We've got a 6520, uh, which is kin to a 6519, and y'all know what the yield potential with that variety is. And we've got a 6642, which I don't know as much about. But we're starting to integrate those varieties into um, our practices here. Um, also, we've still got BioDirect going where we feel like that we can take old products and make them new again. We're looking out, you know, into the decade for this, but we can literally feel like we can take old products who have become resistant and make them where they're useful to the grower again. And this is all through mRNI technology. So we're really, really excited about that coming forward. Now, what a lot of y'all have heard a lot in the press about, is, uh, is our extend launch. So we brought our first technology on the market in 1996, is Roundup Ready Soybeans. It took us about 130 days to get those through regulatory. We've been working to get extend on the market for 1,300, going on 1,400 days. It's been an extensive, extensive work, but we're in the last phase of our environmental impact study on it, and we have a high confidence level that we'll get deregulated sometime the middle of next month. So we're really excited about that. We're going to bring both cotton and soybeans on. Cotton will have three tolerances in it. It will have dicamba, Roundup, and glufosinate. The soybeans will only come with two tolerances, the dicamba and the Roundup. Now, you won't see soybeans for release for next year because we don't have full export approval. And until we have full export approval, we're not going to put them on the market because we don't want to stop trade with China or do something that's going to hurt the farmers or, or any of that kind of thing. So we're looking forward to the extend launch. We're bringing five cotton varieties forward. Three of them will fit in this area. And they will be similar to the varieties that you have planted before and you will be able to know how to manage those varieties. So um, now I'm going to transition back into my talk. So what we found out in working with biotechnology was that we had a couple of tools that we could take into seed breeding and our plant breeding. So about six to eight years ago, we began to start using some of this stuff, seed chippers, molecular markers, things like that. And recently, over the past two to three years, you're starting to see the results of us being able to do that. You're starting to see increased yields in our soybeans. I've heard some great soybean yields out there. You're starting to see our corns take on a life of their own. We've really got some good germplasm out there. And I would, I'd say to you, by 2018, 2019, in our 115 set, you'll probably see a 15 to 20 bushel increase in the next three to four years. One of them that we're going to release this year is going to bring an 8 to 10 bushel advantage over our best stuff. So we're really excited about the pipeline of new germplasm that we've got coming. In cotton, I've already talked a little bit about the, uh, the extend. 
going forward, the next wave of cotton coming from ex or having the extend in it is going to be new germplasm. And with that, you're going to see considerable bumps in yield. So we're really excited about that. We're releasing a brand new B2RF for the lower part of my area this year. And down in South Alabama, Georgia, we're looking at 100 to 200 pound yield increases. And it's really exciting to see this stuff. It's one of the best cottons I've ever seen. And I've been in cotton for an awful long time. So the things that you're going to start seeing in our breeding program are going to be significant. The other thing that's pretty impressive about it is you're getting yield and you're also getting good disease packages. You're getting good grain quality, good fiber qualities in your cotton. So we're getting really good disease packages with this stuff. Um, so as we made the leap from, from Roundup to Biotech to becoming a seed company, which is kind of funny, somebody read something to me the other day, Global Seed Giant Monsanto, and I think it's kind of funny because we feel like we're right here at home and we're not that big, and it's just kind of ironic that people say things like that and kind of gives us a bad name every once in a while. But anyway, you know, it, it gave us the ability, you know, or allowed us to be a, a first mover in that space. And, and we, we had some advantages at first of it. But um, we're kind of at a tipping point when, in, in our business. We're kind of in a transition point. So as I said earlier, when we pivot, we pivot really, really hard. And looking back at everything we've done before, it seemed like it went really, really easy. But being in the middle of it, I, I know it didn't go easy. But things seem to have fallen into place. So we're at a crossroads again. And uh, I think where we're at, we will move a lot faster in the space. Um, we're about to generate more data or in volumes that we've never seen before as a company. Um, this is going to allow us to have insights to help the grower make smarter decisions. Um, this is a big shift for us. We, we've never been in this space before. And uh, one thing I know is we better get it right because there's not a second chance when you start helping growers make those decisions. Um, and being in this space, the lead that we have is being cut down from miles ahead to yards ahead. And this makes the execution of what we're about to do disproportionately important. So what we're looking at is becoming a service provider to deliver whole farm solutions to growers and build recommendations for them. Um, so literally, we could build recommendations for them and not even sell them their seed. However, I feel like if we're delivering Total Farm Solutions, it could only enhance our core business. So to fully integrate that grower's acre, we've got to be able to deliver bushels and pounds that that grower's never seen before. And what we know is that yield is a factor of germplasm, environment, and agronomic practices. So how are we going to do all this? So if you've noticed in, in the press lately, we've acquired a couple of companies. We acquired Precision Ag. We know that in the grain business, you know, seed placement is extremely important. Seed to soil contact, getting uniformity of stand, having the ability to go out there and get a uniform stand will allow you to have higher yields. We also just recently purchased a company called Climate Corp. It's a company that's in the Bay Area of San Francisco. And believe it or not, a company in the Bay Area of San Francisco is steeped in agriculture and has a data set that is beyond belief, historical data for years and years and years. They're going to be able to scrub that data, package it, and present it to the grower in the way that he can make better decisions on his farm so his yields will increase. It will be about soil types. It will be about weather patterns. It will be about varieties. So 
Within Climate Corp, there's two platforms. There's Climate Basic, which is free to the growers. It's at a very limited access in my area, as a matter of fact, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and Tennessee, it's very limited. And in this area, it will give us, it'll give us rainfall, precipitation, it'll give us wind speed, wind direction, and that's about it right now. Now, Climate Basic, like I said, is free to growers. We're on about 50 million acres right now with it. We also have another platform that's called Climate Pro. It comes at a cost. We've launched it into three I states right now. It comes at a $3 premium per acre with a 100% money back guarantee. What we've done is we give them advisors. So we take this data, wrap it up, package it, and hand it to them in the form of an advisor. So they have something that's called plant health advisor. We do aerial imaging for them. They can go in and with that aerial imaging, they can see and it will help them decide when they need to make insect applications, when they need to make fungicide applications on their crops, things like that. The other one that's really important to them is nitrogen advisor. Last year, if y'all remember, it rained every other day. One day or one weekend down in South Alabama, it rained 32 inches in one weekend. Farmer's corn's this big. He's had his nitrogen out for three weeks. He gets 32 inches of rain in coarse soil. How much is there? How much does he need to put back? When does he need to put it back? These are all the things that I'm talking about to help him make the decisions to increase his yields. They're also looking at things like planting advisors. So they take five, ten-year data on your, on your soil type, your weather pattern. They make assumptions for future weather. Harvest advisor. They take into account commodity prices. They take into account should you cut it at 15% moisture? Should you cut it at 20% moisture? Where would you make the most money at? So these are things that we're doing going forward. But... Um, it's all about what everybody in this room is doing. It's all about sustainable, safe agriculture and food for the demand that we're going to have going forward. Have I got any questions? No? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your business.